Lovely. We're in good shape. So hi, uh, my name is Sam Lesson. I'm the, the founder and CEO of a file sharing company called Dropio. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, especially among such luminaries. Um, I think I might be a little bit outclassed, but I'll do my best. So what I kind of was doing is on the way down from, from, uh, from San Francisco this morning, we're actually in New York, but I happened to be in San Francisco for a while, is I was thinking a little bit about our business and what would be interesting to this audience. And, and I started thinking a little bit about what it is that we do, and really what are the fundamental principles that are driving what actually we end up getting done. And I kind of grouped it into two things, which are things that we think are changing and then in, in the internet in a very real-time way, and then things that we actually think people think are changing but aren't necessarily changing. Um, and those are kind of the two things that I thought would be interesting to address in this group. So with that said, I think the, the things I want to run through are first, I'll give you a tiny bit on the problem that really gets us excited at Dropio um, on the internet um, right now in a very practical and tactical way. Talk a little bit about what we think is actually not changing, despite the fact that people think it is. Um, talk a little bit about what we think is changing, and then kind of end with some very theoretical thoughts on maybe why it matters. So, what is Dropio at its core? What Dropio is, is it's basically a plug-and-play pipe for facilitating private file and media sharing on the web. Uh, we do three things that we try to do very well. We ingest media, um, and then we can basically convert it across formats, so we can ingest anything from documents to pictures and video and audio streams, and then flip around the formats they're in for syndication out to things like mobile devices or the web or download. Um, we do it all in real time, so we use something called XMPP, it's our bus, so that we actually can sync out, um, not only in kind of a passive way, but in an active way, all that content. And then very, very importantly, we do it all in a basically input and output agnostic way. Um, what's the difference between picking up a phone and calling in some information versus uploading it from your computer? Actually, very little. It's just about the first step, right? And from there, we can kind of funnel it all through our real-time cross-format, cross-platform, uh, pipe. And so that, that's kind of the core of what we do. We basically allow you to share any content or media with whom you want, how you want. And to do it, you can use Dropio's web interface, um, which is at drop.io. Um, every month, millions of people now use it. And our big clients are people like media agencies, PR firms, et cetera, that need to get around rich media um, between each other and out to clients. Um, you can use our apps, essentially, in other contexts. So we're default installed for all Yahoo Mail users now, um, so that if you want to send media within the context of Yahoo Mail, we can power that. And then also we actually expose a bunch of APIs so that you can latch in and use our services in the context of whatever else you're doing. Um, basically, what drove us to do this was this really interesting conundrum we felt like we were facing in the summer of 2007, which is that it's really, really easy to share with everyone on the web right now, to broadcast information. But it's actually relatively harder to share just bits of information with exactly whom you want, how you want. We felt this very acutely when I, we were working at a, a consulting firm called Bain. And it was very easy for us to go home in the evening and post a video on YouTube and share it with the entire world. But we were having a ton of trouble getting files and rich media around between large, you know, in some cases, Fortune 10 clients. Um, another way to phrase the same conundrum, essentially, is that it's easy and cheap to be public in our, in our increasingly internet world. And it's actually hard and expensive to be private. So that's really, to us, a very huge problem. Because if you think about it, the amount of public information in the world, or the information that you want to be public, is certainly growing rapidly. And I'm a big believer in a lot of the social media and kind of growth of the internet as we're seeing it. But it's still a relatively small percentage of the stacked bar of content in the world, or the content that you privately hold. Whereas the amount of private information, or information you want to sell conditionally with other people, is actually quite large and relatively under-facilitated. So, Essentially, we believe that the internet's been doubling down on developing solutions for publicity, which is wonderful, but has really, really failed to develop the necessary solutions for privacy. So let's talk a little bit about we don't, what we think is not changing in this incredibly dynamic and vibrant world in which we live. First, we're big believers in information theory 101. Um, we believe that if you really parse it down to the, to the concept of binary and build back up from there, that the value of information is fundamentally a function of scarcity. Um, when you kind of tear that out, you can talk about it as a function of probability in some ways, and you can almost think about it as a function of approximately speed and accuracy. Um, the upshot is, is that we really, really believe that, you know, there isn't that much changing as some people like to talk about with social media about the fundamental economics of information and that scarcity is the kind of the driver of value. So 
put in kind of a, a simple way I like to phrase it, is that perfectly fast, untrustworthy information is totally worthless. And perfectly slow, trustworthy information is totally worthless. Um, and when you build that out, you can look at if you're the only one in the world um, who knows with 100% certainty the, the stock price of Walmart tomorrow, we won't ask how you know that, um, at noon, that's completely priceless. But if everyone knows it with 100% certainty, it's totally worthless. Um, the next piece that we think is fundamentally not changing is what does that mean in the context of me personally? People talk a lot about how information dynamics and people, it, it changes the value equation of information. Not in our minds, right? Information has value, and the to me part only factors in as a cost of acquisition or a cost of actually getting that information the last mile down to myself. So what does that end up meaning? It means that knowing my mom's phone number, if I have it written in my pocket, is completely worthless, right? Because the cost of acquiring that information is zero. Whereas knowing my mother's phone mother, if I don't have it in my pocket, is actually quite valuable. The next thing, and this is kind of core to our actually approach and how we think the internet's changing, and, and actually I think might run contrary to some of the things we've discussed kind of in this group, which will be fun for the Q&A, is that if you think about what a conversation is, um, a conversation is a way to transmit information. And we think that there are three fundamental components to that. One is identity, who's speaking. The second is content, what's being said. And the third is distribution, who's listening. Um, I'll come back to that in the, in the section of things that are changing, but the critical element is, is that those three pieces are completely fundamental and necessary to having any sort of meaningful conversation or movement of content, and interestingly, the nature of each will influence the others. So the way in which my identity is represented on a platform and how I believe it to be distributed will fundamentally change the nature of what I say or the content that I can pipe in that context. Um, so they're both, all three are critical, they're very intimately tied, and when you think about something like a Facebook or a Twitter Twitter and the way in which they facilitate content, it's largely focused on the way in which they center and focus on things like identity and distribution that modify how they end up getting used. So very critically, and I'll come back to this, this has always been true and it's going to continue to be true, the medium very fundamentally influences the message of what gets transmitted. So let's talk about what is changing. And this is also, you know, the correlate. This gets you, me excited. So very, very fundamentally, I think we can all agree that it's the relative cost and speed of data acquisition, storage, and then edge-to-edge -edge bandwidth. So I actually, when I say edge-to-edge -edge bandwidth, I literally mean eyeball-to-eyeball. -eyeball. You talk about things like mobile, you talk about things like where data is, that's where that mobile comes in, right? Is it's not about just saying how fast can I get it down a wire between two computers in most cases. It's literally about how fast can I get it down that wire and then get it the last mile into someone's brain so they can react on it um, in a lot of cases. So, if I can continue to click, that's the wrong button. There we go. Um, one derivative of this shift is that what we've seen recently with things like a YouTube or a Facebook, for instance, is that services can actually pay me for distribution rights to my content. That's obviously always been true for large media companies, but it's true across the board now. And so if I'm a YouTube, the way I think about content is that I basically go to a user and I say, here's the deal. You let me have your content, and in return for that, I'll do a few things for you. I'll upload it for you, I'll convert it for you, I'll store it for you, and I'll serve it for you. All valuable, expensive activities, right? But in return, you have to give me the rights then to put it wherever I want to put it and harvest the ads around it, right? And so there's an interesting dynamic there, which again, is, is pretty interesting, and it changes only because of the cost structure of the underlying content itself has changed. What I kind of abstract that to, in some ways, is to say that actually my relative payouts on the margin for being public versus being private have actually fundamentally shift, shifted. So for all of human history, we could have sat across in a bar and had a private conversation at a relatively the same cost. But if I wanted to share a message with the entire world, it would be prohibitively expensive. Maybe the Roman Empire could pull it off, right? For the first time in history, not only have we seen the cost of publicity decline, but we've actually seen a fundamental inversion of the cost of privacy and the cost of publicity. Because now, things like YouTube or Facebook, et cetera, will literally, in some cases in cash, but in most cases in utility and ancillary benefits and things like social credibility and currencies, literally essentially pay me right, to be public. Right? And that's why you're seeing on the margin this shift where people are opening up more because you know what? They're getting paid more to be public. So basically, as I said, the, way, the web is actually literally paying us to be public and charging us in a lot of cases to be private. So, Another thing that's fundamentally changing is the, the three components, and this is like where we start to get into the real Dropio, what we're trying to do, right? Of identity, content, and distribution. 
all still there, all completely critical. But I don't think they're consolidating. I think they're fracturing, and I think they're fracturing very quickly, right? And so what you see is not a consolidation where all three of those things, as historically was true, would be under the same application or, or umbrella. Um, what's happening is you have models like Twitter, which is a pure distribution platform cropping up that actually leverages content via links in an open web um, and leverages identity from other services and other systems offsite to power their, their distribution pipe. You see things like Facebook Connect, which is in a lot of ways an important part of the future of Facebook, which really is drag and drop identity modules that you can put into the context of other content and other distribution formats as the web moves forward. So I would argue that as the web gets more open, um, as the web gets more interoperable, faster and more interconnected, and importantly, as the, the community of, of basically standards-driven um, and, and educated developers grows, you're not going to see a consolidation. You're actually going to see an incredible fracturing and verticalization around these three different activities and even subsets of these three different activities um, powering conversations and the movement of information across the web. If you look at the technology standpoint, you're also seeing the same thing with the technology stack itself. Um, clouds are not buzz. Um, the implications of Amazon Web Services is I think probably we'll look back in 10 years at the 50th and say probably the most important thing that's happening right now. Um, so basically the ability to buy commodity bandwidth storage and processing by any one of these sub-segmented vertical elements and then lash APIs together on APIs to build end user experiences basically is, is as important as the fracturing of the conversation itself. And then the third piece is that there's actually this really interesting dynamic going on right now where there's actually an increasing return on centralization. And so I actually, when I think about something like Amazon Web Services, which I'm obviously unapologetically a pretty big fan of, I think of it as a city, right? And one element of the city is that there's cost sharing, right? We're all in the same location. We can share the same services. So the cost of the services to any one of us can be lower on a per unit basis. But there's actually a compounding return on scale. Right? And this is the really critical element that, that, that basically I think is going to drive the future of cloud computing, which basically means that because I'm in Amazon Web Services, I can use other people's APIs and other verticals at a tiny cost at incredible speed in a way I couldn't otherwise. Right? And so we're now, for instance, interoperating with other APIs and other web services inside Amazon Cloud for free because that's the way they price it, right? and at incredible speeds in ways that you can't do when you talk about going between systems in different ways. So I think that the, the metaphor of the cloud and basically consolidating compute and storage into areas where companies can interact with each other at incredible metropolis-like speeds is a huge, huge deal. So the question becomes, what's the goal of all this? What does this all mean to us in terms of how we're running our business and how we think about our job, which is simple, private, media and file sharing, right? It basically the, means that the goal should be to do one very specific thing and do it exceedingly well, right? This is no longer about building 15 different departments that take care of different pieces of the stack. This is no longer even about building an identity solution, a content solution, a distribution solution. This is about picking your segment and being the best in the world at it. So basically, another way to phrase this is if you're kind of familiar with the, the, like some, some basically corporate, corporatist like firm theory, is more and more we basically, because the cost of communication between services, between computers is going down, you want to have less and less in-house. So that's kind of the Dropio specific stuff. Humor me for a moment, I'll give some of the, the wider stuff and then move on, which is from our perspective, as I said, um, we just do content facilitation. We don't do identity. We don't do distribution. We're very focused on a core segment of what is necessarily an overall conversation. But we think that ultimately when you think about it, it that's actually a pretty good metaphor for everything that, that's going on. Provide something simply and charge for it and move on. Um, so when you scope that out even more, we think that the big implications are one, development at its core is going to speed up. You're going to see more individual developers with more leverage from more different places, strapping into the services they need, and building incredible end consumer solutions and end user solutions for the problems that they see in the world. The second 
is again, the opportunities around spe specialization, but also the opportunities are basically around leveraging the new reality of these cost structures to find and monetize new information and even social gestures is a big one right now that you can kind of grab. So, you know, there's a, there's a company in, in New York called Betaworks and what they talk about is that they want to be monetizing and figuring out how to use all the exhaust data that's being collected and stored in the web and on Twitter um, to build businesses. You know, that's an interesting metaphor. What it basically comes down to is saying we're leveraging the fact that more information is being generated and it's cheaper to store it. So that's really interesting stuff. So I'll end with, with three or four, because I can't remember how many slides I put in here, risks um, that I think are, are interesting here. And there are real ones. First one that I'm personally very concerned with is we talk a lot about how identity and distribution change the message. Um, is the internet as a platform, is our web services that we're developing fundamentally actually changing the types of language and messages we can use on the web? It may be, right? When we're changing the cost structure of, of communication with certain biases, it actually changes what you can and can't say in some interesting ways. Um, Coming out of that, are we as a society right now actually creating monocultures and big points of failures um, for our society overall? It's wonderful that we live in one world. I love it. Um, it's wonderful that we can communicate you know, broadly and we can all you know, watch a new movie in maybe 10 years from now that's instantly distributed everywhere around the world. But that's a very different model than we've lived for the last five, 10,000 years, right? And it's a lot less resilient one if we get something wrong. Right, and so I'm very concerned actually that the network and the net in general is actually making us less resilient, not more resilient. And this is my fun last point, which is there's a lot of similarities between the ways people are using APIs right now and the ways financial products exist. Um, if you look kind of backwards, what really was the, the financial crisis? The financial crisis was the packaging and repackaging of an interconnected set of information systems and essentially um, APIs of finance to package things up and resell them with leverage. That's great. We use leverage in our business on terms of Amazon Web Services and 15 other people we interoperate with. The problem becomes is that when you abstract this stuff more and more and more, you actually lose some fundamental understanding of what's sitting below what you're doing. You're actually losing information about what you're using. And so, again, I, I, don't, I would be hesitant to predict anything, but I would say that unless we come up with some much smarter solutions pretty quickly, I would argue it's almost inevitable that we're going to see the types of collapses in systems um, where you yank one piece out over there and it happens to collapse everything over there going forward with the internet that we've seen in the financial markets recently. They're actually exceedingly similar. Um, and so I'll leave it with that. I know that's been a little bit all over the place, but hopefully some interesting thoughts um, to just mull on in terms of the way we're thinking about the world. Thank you.